Hey, everybody. All right. This is going to be a really, really exciting time. We've got something special for you here today, something that I have never seen done. Um, we're going to be cold calling some prospects live. So we're going to get into it pretty quick. Just a couple things off the bat. Uh, we're recording. So you can share this with your teammates or your boss later and, and talk to them about how you, they need to support you more. Um, we are going to take some questions at the end, but I have a feeling we're going to have a lot. So what I want you to do is put them in the Q&A section. And then um, hopefully you can kind of like upvote each other's questions. So we just get the most popular ones. So right now, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A section. If you want to say hi, uh, go ahead and open the chat section. You guys can use chat um, to talk to each other, you know, have whatever kind of conversations, follow me on LinkedIn, whatever you want to do in there. Um, let's get to it. So I'm Colin Campbell. I'm just host today. Not much from me. Uh, we're joined by three very brave people. Um, Josh Braun's here. And if you know Josh, Josh Braun, he's founder of Josh Braun Sales Training, recently created a new thing called a tongue-tied sales objection flashcards. Really cool way to practice handling objections. Josh, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you again. We always have a good time. Uh, Ryan Reisert's here. He is the founder and uh, student of sales at Reisert Consulting. Thanks for being here, Ryan. I'm excited. This is gonna be a lot of fun. We got some really cool things to talk about with you too. Phone ready leads, a couple other things in there. And then man of the hour, everybody uh, drop an applause in the chat for Joe Harlow. Joe is a sales development representative from Cognizum, who is the sponsor of today's webinar. And Joe is out on the plank with no safety net. Today, he's cold calling his real prospects live with real script that he's really using to really try to set some meetings and sell some Cognizum. So this is like super exciting. Haven't done this before and very, very brave. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for being willing to do this for the sales hacker community. We're, we're glad you're here. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Not really. Be a fun I, mean, time. I, I heard he's also, he also like bungee jumped. So this it, it pales in comparison to that, I suppose, but brave for sure. <laughs> True. Yeah. Probably a little less butterflies in the stomach now than, than bungee jumping. We'll, um, have to, we'll, we'll have to ask once this is over, which one was more terrifying, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> right. the end. Ready to go? We're ready to go. Let's do it. All right. All right let me, uh, is it anybody, I don't know in the chat, like if anybody knows who this guy is. Anybody, anybody in the chat know, Colin? Anybody have any idea who this Let's guy see. is? Let's see. Free solo. Someone's, oh yeah, Alex H. Yeah. Alex so yeah. This, this is a guy who climbed a really high mountain called El Capitan. It was 3,000 foot of cliff, uh, but he did it without ropes. So you let go and you are pretty much done. Well, we're gonna top that today. We got this guy, Joe. He is gonna be doing some cold calling without a net. So live cold calls, you're gonna actually hear both sides of the call. And that's what we're gonna get to. Um, but first I got a pop quiz for everyone. Imagine for a second, you're like Joe for a while. You have to book meetings with people and it's the end of the month and you're not doing too well. You're a little behind quota. You cold call a prospect. If you book a meeting with them, it's worth like five points. It could bring you back up in contention. You make the call, the prospect picks up and says, I, I can't talk, you caught me at the gym. Question is, what do you say? When I asked this question on LinkedIn several months ago, got a, close to 50,000 views and almost 200 people responded. And responses fell into two buckets. One is what I call a pressure-based response, meaning, the salesperson was trying to ask for something, mostly time. When can I call you back? Can you call me back? Can I steal 37 seconds to talk right now? And the other response was no pressure, which means they weren't asking for anything. They were staying in the moment. So I'm gonna show you some responses and you tell me if they're pressure-based responses or no pressure-based responses. So here's one from someone. Looks like you're hard at work. Looks like I'm catching you at a bad time. I'll go ahead and send a calendar invite this afternoon. Does that work better for you? Is that a pressure-based response or no pressure? What are people saying in the comments, Colin? Most people in the comments saying pressure. A couple of no pressures in there. because it's yeah, a little bit pres soft, pr pressure, pressure because the definition of pressure is I'm asking someone, I smell the smell of sales. I smell the meeting, right? I'm trying to ask for the meeting. Here's another one. Pressure or no pressure, health is key. Would like a, there's that phrase, would like a, that's, a, that's the tell, pressure or no pressure. 
What are people saying in the comments? Uh, this one's a little seems a little trickier, but we're mm. getting mostly pressure. Mostly, mostly pressure. pressure. Yeah, that's exactly it. So I would like a flash of your time, pressure based. What about this one? What do we think, people? Still, almost everybody pressure, light pressure, but still there. Still pressure. What about this one? <laughs> So no pressure, right? So no pressure. if you tally all this up out of the 190 responses, what percentage of the responses were pressure-based versus no pressure-based? If you had to guess, what percentage were pressure versus no pressure? These are salespeople trying to book meetings. What are people saying in the comments? Yeah, almost all these guesses are like 90% pressure. Yeah, it's pretty close. It was at 82, 18. The question is what's causing the pressure? The cause of the pressure is commission breath. We all as salespeople are paid to be able to book meetings. And when we are paid to book meetings, prospects can smell that on our breath. The problem is we are selling in a linear process. We're trying to get people from point A to point B. We're trying to get them to meet with us and we're trying to get them to buy. The challenge is when we're reaching out to people, they're not on a straight line. They're kind of all over the place and we're calling them at the very beginning. And because we're moving faster than the prospect is ready to move, they feel the pinch. They feel the pressure. And whenever people feel sales pressure, they pull away. Um, I'll prove it to you actually. Imagine that you're in the mall and you're taking a walk and one of those mall kiosk people turns to you and says, hey, can I ask you a question? If you're like most people, you'll look away and you'll pick up the pace and walk a little faster because you're afraid of the pinch. You're afraid that if you agree to the question, you're gonna be sold some sea scrub that you probably don't need. The headline to this is that on a cold call, contrary to what you might believe, talking people into things doesn't work because of the pressure. Talking people into things actually has the adverse effect. You tell a teenager, hey, you should really stop smoking because of X, Y, and Z, they're gonna actually smoke more. Tell Ryan to stop drinking beer because it's bad for him. He's going to have more beers than he did before. It's actually called the backfire effect. It's how humans are wired. And, and, and oddly enough, as salespeople, we're doing the opposite. We're trying to talk them into stuff. So what I want to talk to you about today is a different approach, a way out, if you will, that actually changes your intent. It's a small mindset shift. Instead of having an intent to actually book a meeting, because when you're thinking, I got to book a meeting at all costs, I say things like, I'll call you after you're done at the gym. I'll book a meeting with you in 15 minutes. You actually behave in ways that are salesy and manipulative and gross. And when prospects feel the pinch and the push, they pull away. So you're going to detach from the outcome. That's what we're going to be doing today during this call. What do I mean by that? It's really to set a different purpose for the cold call. It's to reduce the pressure in things that you're saying and how you're saying it so that you actually create an environment where prospects can trust you because they sense you don't have an ulterior motive to get the meeting. That your only motive is to get to the truth behind every conversation you have with a prospect, which is one of two things. Yes, they'd like to continue talking with you or no, they don't at this time. And it's okay either way. Let me actually show you a little clip from Seinfeld that reinforces what it feels like, what a detached mindset feels like, and what it embodies. Take a listen. Jerry. Yes? I've been doing a lot of thinking. Uh-huh. Well, I don't think we should see each other anymore. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> what? No, it's fine. No problem. I'll meet somebody else. Oh, really? Sure. See, things always even out for me. Huh? It's fine. Anyway, it's been really nice dating you for a while. And, uh, good luck. Yeah, you too. Really coming around. So you're going to see during this approach that we're going to be going through when Joe calls, we've been working on this, is Joe's going to be a lot like Jerry Seinfeld. He's kind of not caring too much. Like, he knows that there is this concept called conversations, not a conversation. It's about having conversations, not focused on a conversation. And oddly enough, when you are okay with not booking a meeting, 
and you realize that you actually don't control other people. You can't create the motivation. You actually align with it. Oddly enough, some interesting thing happens. When you detach, you actually get to more truth because prospects don't feel like you have an ulterior motive. You actually end up having more conversations because prospects can sense that you don't have your best interest before theirs. You actually chase less. You actually have smaller pipelines, but the deals that you have actually close and you actually have a higher close rate because you're not babysitting opportunities in this land of, I'm not sure I'm just chasing because prospects are afraid to get back to you because they know if they do, you're gonna sell them. The best reps that I know actually have smaller pipelines, not fatter pipelines, because they don't waste time and they don't burden themselves with babysitting opportunities that are, that are not gonna close. So that's a little bit on mindset. Let's actually now shift to what to say. When tasked with what to say, I have to start with a story. And you tell me the moral of the story and what this has to do with cold calling. It's probably the most important thing in this whole webinar. Several years ago, I'm in the mall with my wife. I did not need anything. I was just there keeping her company. I walked into a fit to run store just to kill some time. If the store associate said, what brings you in today? I would have said nothing. If she said, can I help you? I would have said no. But she didn't say any of those things. Instead, she looked down at my sneakers. She said, are you a runner? I said, yes. She said, what distance? I said, I'm training for a marathon. And she said, have you ever had a running gate test? And moments later, I'm on a treadmill. She freezes the frame and she said, you noticed how your ankles are pronating. They're actually over pronating. And I go, yeah, I do see that. And then she said, did you know that if you run in sneakers that are not made for pronated feet, you can get injured on long distance runs. And if you'd like, I can take a look at your sneakers to see if they're made for pronated feet. And about six minutes later, I'm spending 180 fucking dollars on new sneakers and insoles. The moral of the story, of course, and the thing that pieced my curiosity is the cost of inaction. What terrible, no good, very bad thing happens to your prospects if they do nothing? Not about your value proposition, not about faster sneakers, I got sneakers. All of your prospects are running in sneakers today. In order for you to have the best chance at getting someone's attention, you have to know something that they don't know that can hurt them. What does doing nothing cost? I call it poking the bear, which is essentially what that rep did in the shoe store. She asked me a question that was difficult to answer. She made me think differently about my sneakers. She got me to scratch my head and think, hmm, I'm not sure. So let's talk about how to do that. The step one is understanding what doing nothing costs your prospects. If they just did things the way they were doing it, what would that cost? Let me give you an example with regards to Cognizant, because that's what we're going to be cold calling to sell today. And I always like to think of this as before and after. Sales is all about the contrast. It's all about the before and the after. So let's actually use a visual to describe this. So on the left-hand side, if people are not using Cognizant, they got a bunch of accounts that they are prospecting into. And they all look the same. So a list of accounts and a list of prospects. And what ends up happening is these prospects 86% of the time are looking and doing research about solving their problems without you even knowing about it. It's invisible. They're just doing it. You have no idea which ones are doing it. So what ends up happening is they're doing research and they're Googling some stuff and they're looking at your competitors without you even knowing it. And look what happens to them. These accounts actually end up buying and engaging with other sales organizations without you even knowing it. So when you reach out, they say, hey, got something for that. We're working with somebody already. We're in the final stages with X. And so you end up losing all of these accounts without you even knowing about it. Nothing you can even do about it. You don't even know which ones to call. That's the cost of inaction. It's just losing accounts to your competitors. So after Cognizant, this is what changes. Instead of seeing all these white circles, you're able to get x-ray vision. You're able to see these red dots. And these red dots are prospects in your accounts that you've been assigned that are actually searching for terms and Google terms and doing research on terms that relate to what it is that you're selling. It shows their intent. So that when you reach out to them, they're more likely to wanna to have a conversation with you because they're already actively shopping. And what that allows you to do is hang on to more of those people because you're talking to them first and first matters. 
a lot of data to suggest that the first vendor to engage in those conversations early in the sales cycle wins the deal. So now that we have this hypothesis that you have to have for your company, for your prospects, we know the before, we know what they stand to lose, and we know the after, now and only now can we start to construct a script. So let's walk you through the script that I wrote with Joe, and we're gonna just take you through it, and then we're gonna actually have Joe cold call and use it on some real prospects. So this is what to say, and not only what to say, how to say it. Because what you say is a small part of it. Your tonality is everything. And Joe is a master at tonality. And I'll show you what I mean in a moment. So this is something called uh, the poke the bear framework. It's got four parts to it. Each start with the letter P, permission problem, poke the bear question, and then a promise. So let me actually take you through it. Um, you guys probably have seen this a bunch of times before. It's a really good method to start a conversation is to ask the prospect if it's okay to talk. And the reason for that is called congruence. When people give you permission to talk, they want to hold up their end of the bargain and hear you out. Because if they don't, it feels incongruent. It's no different than you saying, I'll pick someone up at five and you don't show up. It feels bad. So that's the psychology behind the permission-based opener. That's why it's happening. There are literally 32 ways to do this. I have an ebook that's for free on my LinkedIn profile. You can go grab it. Everyone has their favorites. And these are three that Joe and I kind of looked at. And they all have the same thing in common. They're asking for permission. So option one, hey, Joe, John, my name is Joe. I'm calling on a recorded line. We've never met, but I'm hoping you can help me out for a moment. Not... Hey, Joe, this is John. I, we've never met, but I'm hoping you can help me out for a moment. Notice that's a lot of uptone. It's kind of like straight and almost like a downtone, right? So, hey, hey John, um, we've never met, but I was uh, hoping you could help me out for a moment. Hey, John, I I'm Joe calling on a recorded line. We've never met, but I was hoping to speak with you briefly. Uh, do you have two minutes? Not, do you have two minutes? So I'm going to role play this with Joe. I know he picked one of his favorites here. And uh, we're just going to role play it. I'm going to pick up. I'm going to be John. Uh, hi, this is John. Hey, John. I'm Joe. I'm uh, calling on a recorded line. Uh, we've never actually met, but I was hoping you could help me out for a moment. God, I love that accent. Ryan, don't you love that accent? Isn't that a killer <laughs> accent? Don't you wish you had that, Ryan? For, imagine what you would do, Ryan, if you had that accent. Oh, man. I mean. I <laughs> <laughs> All right, so notice, notice how Joe was real, like, calm, leaning. I call it leaning back because he's okay. If the prospect doesn't want to talk, we'll just go to the next call. There's going to be about 15 or 20% of the people that are just adverse to getting on a cold call, even if they're VPs of sales and they have outbound teams. We're not here to, it's not your job to change their mind. You don't control other people. We're just going to accept that in a very calm way, like a golfer. We're just going to go to the next hole. So a percentage of those people are going to say, sure, how can I help you? And then we're going to go to the next P, which is problem. And we've got a couple versions of this that we're going to test out to see which one feels better. Uh, the first one sounds like this. Uh, thanks. Um, reason that I'm calling is that we're hosting an event on a little known method, a little known way to lower the risk of losing deals to your competitors. So I was hoping that I could ask you a question to see if this might be relevant. Would that be okay? Now, psychology here. Um, this idea of hosting an event, this is not a webinar. This is a one-on-one -on -one event for a prospect, but it's educational. Rather than pitching a product, we're going to show people the problem that we articulated earlier on in this webinar, because most people that we reach out to are pitch adverse. So by positioning this as an educational event and a learning event, it's going to be more attractive to people. It's why you're on this webinar. Um, a lot of people like to learn stuff. Um, we're also illuminating what they don't want, which is losing deals to a competitor. And we're also asking their permission if we can essentially qualify them or learn a little bit more about them. And we're doing that in a very succinct way around something that they stand to lose. Um, here's another version of that around something that's more positive. And again, they can land differently depending on who we're calling. And Joe can switch this up, which is, hey, the reason that I'm calling is we're hosting an event on little known ways for sales teams to identify accounts that actually have intent to buy a product like yours over the next 90 days. 
So I was hoping that I could ask you a couple questions to see if this might be relevant. Um, would that be okay? So we're gonna role play this out a little bit. And uh, sure, Joe, um, you, can, uh, you can have some time to talk. What's on your mind? Thanks, Josh. The uh, reason for my call is that we're actually hosting an event on little known ways to lower the risk of uh, losing deals to competitors. So I was just hoping if I could ask you a couple of quick questions uh, to see if this might be relevant. Would that be All okay? Right, so Joe, I want to slow you down. I want to slow down a little bit. Yeah. On there, I know it's nerve wracking doing this live on a webinar, but let's actually slow you down a little bit and a little louder. Uh, sure. How, how can I help you? Thanks, Josh. Uh, the reason for my call is that we're actually hosting an event on little known ways to lower the risk of losing deals to competitors. Um, so I was just hoping if I could ask you a couple of quick questions to see if this might be relevant. Would that be okay? Okay, awesome. And notice the word might be. Again, these are words intentionally put in here to diffuse the pressure. Not, not assuming. Not assuming. And a percentage of people will say, sure. And then we're going to go to the poke the bear. We're going to ask a question that's a little difficult to answer. Hey, uh, John, just, just out of curiosity, how is your sales team identifying accounts that are actually in market for products like yours? Are they like getting inbound leads? looking at open rates to see, or are they actively able to see which accounts are researching topics that relate to your products? Um, Chris Voss of Never Split the Difference fame calls this the illusion of choice or the illusion of control. We're actually asking a question that's a little difficult to answer. And we're also showing a little credibility by explaining how they're probably currently doing it and what they could be doing in C without actually pitching. A lot of people, when someone asks this question, goes, well, what do you mean by C? Because they don't exactly know what that is. That's the thing that they could be doing better that they might not know about. The other thing that the multiple choice style allows people to do is make it easier to answer the question. Um, sometimes if we cut it off before that, it can be a little difficult for people to answer. But if we give them some choices, um, it makes it a little bit easier for them to answer. Or they might say, you know, it's something else, or we're not doing really much. So uh, let's actually role play this little section with Joe real quick. And uh, yeah, sure, sure. You can ask me a couple questions. What's up, Joe? Great, thanks, John. I really appreciate that. Um, so just wanted to understand really how your sales team are identifying accounts that are in the market for products like yours. You know, are they working off inbound leads, looking at email open rates, or are reps able to actually identify accounts that are actively researching topics related to products like yours? You got it. Now, so in this section, we're gonna have a conversation and we're gonna use a lot of these curiosity phrases. Um, we, we're doing inbound leads. Uh, you might mirror like a Chris Voss, uh, inbound leads. How's that been going? Um, how are reps prioritizing MQLs? Sounds like you got a great process in place. Anytime we have an opportunity to positively label what the prospect is doing to make them feel good is gonna be awesome. Um, you'll be surprised a lot of times at this point in the conversation, Prospects will say, well, what's this about? What do you guys do? And the question and the conversation going a lot of different ways, but eventually we'll transition um, into this last part, which is the promise. And it sounds something like this, you know, since, you know, sounds like it's a, a Chris Voss label, um, this, might, this event might make sense since you're not able to do X. You know, identify accounts that are potentially interested in speaking with you. Again, might be interested, potentially. That low assumptive language. Um, I know I promised to be brief. Would it make sense? Almost like you're a little lost here. Like, would it make sense for you to attend the event so you can review what your options are? Should a need arise in the future? Now, let me explain the psychology there. It's all about reducing pressure. And so what we're doing here is reviewing your options, not for now, but should a need arise in the future? That's going to just reduce the pressure of prospects feeling that you're trying to get them to sign on the dotted line now. So these words are very intentional around reducing pressure and letting the prospect be in control of if they want to move forward or not. Because ultimately, when you take the freedom of choice away, people retreat. So let's actually role play this last part, Joe. Uh, we've had a little conversation and now, Joe, you're going to kind of transition into the promise. Okay, so it sounds like this event might make sense since you're not able to identify accounts that are potentially interested in speaking with you. Um, look, I, I know I promised to be brief. Would it make sense for you to attend the event so you can review what your options are should a need arise in the future? You got it. That's the idea there. Now, this is a script, but Joe can kind of go in a lot of different directions um, with it. 
Um, we've also practiced a lot of objections. So this is a new product that I came out with called Tongue Tied 34 Objection Flashcards. We're gonna actually demo a couple of these. If you wanna learn more about this, that's that lengthy URL on the bottom of it. But here, let me just kind of throw one at Joe. We actually did a bunch of role plays with these earlier. And we're gonna throw in the uh, send me some information one, which is a common one. We did about four or five of these, but hey, Joe, sounds interesting. Um, can you send me some information? Not a problem. What information would you like? Um, you know, just anything about the um, anything about the event. Yeah, absolutely. Just so I don't do you a disservice and send information that might not be relevant. Would it be okay if I just ask you a quick couple of questions? Um, just send me anything, just like an, any kind of general description. Okay, well, um, look, typically, John, uh, I might be misreading here. When people say send anything, it usually means they aren't interested, which is not a problem at all. Um, I know you didn't ask me to call you. Okay, that was as a masterful job. And this is what happens when you don't practice your objections on your prospects. Joe did a masterful job of getting out of the buyer-seller dance and just getting the more truth behind the objection. Um, and the reason he was able to do that so eloquently is because he just practiced for five minutes on that particular flashcard. Um, so don't practice on your prospects, pra practice with yourself on these flashcards. All right, let's get to it. Um, now that you kind of have some context, um, this is live cold calling. So the biggest problem with cold calling is that nobody picks up the phone. Like you call and nobody picks up the phone. That's especially difficult for live cold calling. Be like watching paint drive. Ryan over here has this new thing that allows you to actually have more conversations. Ryan, what is this thing, phone picker uppers? What, what, what are you doing? What's happening? That's my, that's my eloquent segue. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, so at the end of the day, you know, I've been uh, like uh, many of us in sales trying to figure out how do you uh, get the folks on our list to, to have conversations with me. And um, over the years, I, I discovered that um, on any given list, um, while we, we think that the connect rate is around three to 5% when we're cold calling and nobody picks up the phone, in reality, um, that's not true. Uh, if you take a list uh, and you call a list, there are people who pick up and there's people who don't. So what we do here with phone ready leads is we've uh, created a different approach that takes uh, an average list that maybe if you called picks up every 20, maybe 50 dials. Um, and instead, which you'll see today, Joe will be calling and we'll have a conversation every maybe two to six dials. Yeah, so this is, this is really interesting. And this is not technology that I have to add, right? This is not, I don't have to add like a tech stack or anything like that. I just give you the list and it comes back, right? No technology, Joe doesn't have to change his approach, his process. Uh, you know, you can actually double, triple, Quintuple your sales productivity without is that a word. Quintuple is that a word? That's... Something like that. Okay. Without without having to add uh, additional people. So um, that's the that's the that's the game here. Yeah, and so we're doing this without a net. And and again, I know Colin did a nice job of you know talking about this at the beginning, but this is Joe. Like Joe is doing this live cold calling session um, without a net, and he's able to do this for a couple of reasons. One, the guy's adventurous, but two, he's also detached man. Like. He's going to still get the bungee jump and eat whatever happens. We're going to support Joe. We know what it's like to cold call. And at the end of the day, everything's going to be okay no matter what happens. Nobody's going to remember any of these calls when we call and life is going to go on and it's unpredictable. Um, you're going to be hearing both ends of the call and we're going to let him call and get into the groove. And if something comes off the rails or it doesn't go well, we're not going to chime in. We're just going to let him be like a golfer and let him go to the next call. And we're going to see if we can get him into a flow state a little bit. Um, so Joe, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, we're going to see how this goes. We've never done this before live on a, on a webinar. So it'll be interesting to see how, how this goes. We'll begin. Hello. Hey, Steve, I'm Joe calling on a recorded line. Uh, we've never actually met, but I was hoping to speak with you briefly. Do you have two minutes? About what? Yeah, I completely appreciate your call, Jack the Blue here. Um, look, the reason for my call is that my company, Cognizant, is actually hosting an event on little known ways to lower the risk of losing deals to competitors. So I was hoping if I could ask you a couple of questions to see if this might be relevant. Would that be okay? Yeah, no, I'm not really interested in it. Thank you. 
Okay, um, that's not a problem. But hey, just before we hang up, um, if I'm not too asking too much, is it because you and the team don't do much prospecting or you hate getting cold calls as much as I hate making them? You know, I, I don't I don't make the decisions on what we do for uh, training and and or marketing and or the, uh, sales training. Uh, so you would need to talk to somebody else. Okay, that's absolutely not a problem. Uh, it sounds like I must have come through to the wrong wrong person then. Um, but look, I, I know it's not your job to help salespeople that are lost. Um, but would you be opposed to telling me who might be the best person to reach out to? No. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks so much for your help and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, you too. Okay, let's uh, let's pause for a second there. Um, so, Joe! <laughs> so, so, so a couple of things there, guys. You, you noticed three objections came up and really elegantly... We were working on those three objections just yesterday from the flashcards and stayed in the pocket and stayed in the groove and was calm. Joe, how did that feel for you? Uh, it, it felt really good, actually. Um, it's obviously quite new. We only went through it yesterday, but um, it, it was nice. I think three months ago when he said, uh, I'm not interested, it would have stopped the conversation right there. So, Yeah. Ryan, what was your take on that? If you guys haven't gotten these things yet... <laughs> That I mean, it couldn't have been more scripted. That was absolutely incredible. Uh, just staying in the pocket, staying relaxed. Uh, you know, you actually paused a little bit and, and allowed him to respond without continuing to talk, which is crucial. And you gathered some more information. One of the things that you might want to go for, you know, I know it's a little nerve wracking too, is can continue to ask for some contact information. But other than that, flawless. That was fantastic really job. Great. Yeah, Fantastic. and that's what I would consider. I would consider that a positive. And though that's not a meeting that booked, but that's a positive conversation because, to Ryan's point, it's able to get a referral, and now we can kind of leverage that referral and uh, have maybe a warmer introduction. Because sometimes, despite this list, we could have a good message, but we're calling the wrong people. Like, and that's going to happen, and we have to make the most of it. So, great job, Joe. Let's keep going here. Um, so much of this too, that another benefit of using Ryan's service is you can actually start to test product message fit. Um, this is our first attempt at this message. It might be the wrong message. Um, it's one that I wrote with the team like in a day. And so we may need some time to kind of see which one's landing and this allows us to accelerate that. It's all about experiments. This could be the wrong message. We'll see. Sometimes I find that if you uh, put yourself in a tree pose, Joe, the connects happen. <laughs> so again, it's like there's a uh, there's a couple of benefits beyond connecting and booking meetings here. Um, the primary one is to test message fit. So if we're calling the right people, we are not getting deep into the conversation. So we're not getting a lot of people past part two. What that means is we have to change part two. Right? We don't have enough connects yet to be able to come to that conclusion. But the nice thing about this service that Ryan's offering is we can come to that faster before we start writing emails like this and sending them, right? So this is our first attempt at the messaging. Once we get about 10 connects or so, or 15 connects, and we know they're the right people, but we're falling flat at part two, we can start to make adjustments quicker. Normally that would take us maybe a month or three weeks to get to. We yeah. can actually start to change and alter the script to try some different things. Um, but it's still a little early to tell. Yeah, sure. Uh, Ryan, what pose did you say it was? Oh, it's this pose. Oh, Sorry. tree pose, tree pose. You gotta get to the tree, tree pose. pose. Tree pose, okay. Yes. Usa. <sighs> but uh, yeah, I tend, to, I tend to look at 20, 20 connects before I start making adjustments and you know, Sure then. <laughs> okay, so a couple couple of things on that. Um, with, regards to the, with regards to the role play, Joe, let's role play it again because I think we, we skipped one little part there, which is like, call me at a bad time. Hey, just so I don't do you disservice and call you back at an, an, another awful time, uh, would it be okay if I stole a second to tell you why I'm calling, give you some context so you can decide if it makes sense for me to call you back? No, 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 I can't. I'm running. Hey, no problem. Then the three sentence thing. And then you get the email address. So let's actually role play that again. Just to sure. burn that in. Hey, you know what, Joe, I can't talk right now. I, 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 it's a bad time. I have a knack for calling people um, always at a bad time. Uh, would it be okay if I just borrow a minute to give some context as to why I called uh, and you can decide whether it's worth me calling back? 
last well, year. You know what? I really can't. I, I, I literally have to go into a meeting in like two seconds. Okay, so sorry, my time is always horrible. Uh, if it's not too much to ask, can I send you a free sentence email and will you get read it and let me know if it sounds interesting? Sure, I'd be happy to. All right, brilliant. Thanks, Josh. What? Wait, what's your email address? Is your email, no, is your email address josh at acme.com? Yeah. Okay. okay, you got it, you got it. So another, another great opportunity to kind of practice that one. That's another one we practiced yesterday on the call. But I also love the reaction the prospect had to your opener and you delivered that really well. So good job on that. I actually think that that one was much more natural for you. Yeah, Joe. me too. You know, yeah, the, the, nat, the natural laugh and you could tell yeah. like right away. Uh, that was, that was fantastic. I agree. That little laugh so, sells it. Hey, Robert, it's Joe from Cognizant on a recorded line. Um, you're probably going to hate me because this is a cold call. Would you like to hang up or roll the dice? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, thanks. The, the reason for my call is that my company is actually hosting an event on little known ways to lower the risk of losing deals to competitors. So I was just hoping if I could ask you a quick couple of questions to see if it might be relevant. Would that be okay? Yeah, you're calling me believing I am where? Um, yeah, but I'm probably the wrong person to do this with. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's not probably, a problem. No, I, I mean, I'm just trying to help you out here. Uh, so, this is, so this is more about leads, right? Yeah, that's correct. I think you, your, your best bet is to. Hold on. I mean, they definitely do. That's right. Phone calls all the time, don't they? Um, okay, I completely appreciate that. And. Um, Obviously, I appreciate you're not the right person, but is it okay if I just ask you a couple of questions just so that I can tailor that outreach as much as possible? Sure. <laughs> cool. So, um, I obviously, you know, she head up the sales side. How are your sales team currently identifying accounts that are in market for products like yours? You know, are you working heavily off an inbound model, looking at email open rates? Yeah, you, you, you'd really have to do that. Just move it into uh, okay. okay, I completely appreciate that, Robert. All right, have a great day. Oh, he's hung up. <laughs> yeah. he's, did he say SDR? Yeah, SDR. I think that's, uh, you oh, know, there's generic, like group emails. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Cool. So we have, what, how many connects we're in? Like five or so? Uh, Joe, well, I'll have the history. I can take okay. a look at it, but... Uh... I think it's around five, uh, six maybe. Yeah, and so this is this is really good because what we're able to do after this, after we regroup and we'll, we'll take a listen, we have some you know, 10, 10 more minutes is, and if we're not getting deep into these calls, which we're not really getting deep into right now, it's a really good sign to say, hey, let's let's see if we can't change some of the part two part of the script. Um, this just allows us to accelerate that. Um, but again, it's it's kind of early. got five connects on 16 attempts. Okay. Yeah. So again, um, the conventional wisdom is successful cold calls are only about booking meetings. Um, of course, that is important, but there's also other successful outcomes. Um, getting referrals, because rather know that the message isn't fitting on a cold call than spin up a sequence of eight emails and wait three or four weeks to spin through all those emails to determine that your response rates are low. I'd rather know now after 15 or 20 connects that, hey, we are calling the right people and the message just isn't landing. Let's change the message and do this again tomorrow. It's these tiny experiments. This is real cold calling. Sometimes it takes a few iterations to dial in the message. This just allows you to accelerate that. And again, a little early to tell. Um, well, let's see if we can't get a few more connects. And I'm just listening to the energy too. Like how, how interested are people sounding in what we're saying? Well, also, you know, when you are getting into these connects now, Joe's getting into the flow state. Yeah. Let's get into the flow state. It's going to feel, it's going to continue to feel a little better. It's true. Let's see if we can't get one more connect on for us. And we'll do some Q&A.
Hello, it's Brian. Hey, Brian, it's Joe from Cognizant calling on a recorded line. Um, listen, Brian, you're probably going to hate me because this is a cold call. Um, would you like to hang up or, or roll the dice? Uh, yeah, I think I'm good. <laughs> okay. okay, fair enough. <laughs> I was trying another one. <laughs> She's hung straight away. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I love that opener, man. You do it really well. Yeah, it's your nat. It's I really like. Very, yeah, you, very, it's, it's, very it's natural good. for you, Joe. It's good. It's good. And yeah, look, look, you're gonna get when that you saw that other the, the reaction that other guy had. I mean, I think it's that's a it's a good open. And that's a, to Ryan's point. Like some openers just fit your personality better. That's why there's like thirty of them, and you kind of spin through them and you see which one feels good for you. There's always gonna be one who's gonna hang up, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's more than one usually you're going to find the one that you're super comfortable with but you're never yeah. going to be a hundred percent there's no yeah. way you know and uh that's okay right you can always call them back try another one <laughs> um okay so i do want to i do want to save some time for some uh some questions and again just to, just to kind of recap here um i know we didn't book any meetings uh, so many people may be thinking about this as well this this was not good um but again there's a lot of ways to look at this uh we learned a ton we had six or seven conversations. And if we do the analysis and say, hey, these are the right people, um, but we're not getting deep, let's go do this again tomorrow and change the message and see if we can't get to the third part of the call. We were only able to get to the third part of the call, not one time. We just were able to get past the second part. And this is what it is to be like a professional, right? We're seeing like, we're gonna try these four parts and we're gonna see like, how deep are we getting? And let's change the part one, let's change the part two, let's change the part three so we can actually start to analyze on the call. Um, I do want to open it up for questions either from Joe uh, or Colin or Ryan or myself about anything because we have about seven or eight minutes. But I also want to say, Joe, man, this was a heroic effort by you, man. I mean, being able to cold call live in front of a studio audience without ropes, man, hat tip to you, buddy. Yeah, amazing. Amazing job, Joe. You're getting, I don't know if you see the chat, but uh, we're all so proud of you. You're, you're just... going to get some, uh, some uh, outreach. Someone's going to be trying to poach you, sir. <laughs> That was yeah. phenomenal. Most of those were Joe's family giving him. <laughs> we got any? We got any questions, Colin? Oh, that was phenomenal. Yeah, we do. Um, one of the questions, and I'm going to do this one first, just because I can handle it. We had a couple people um, asking if. Uh, how, so, how, Joe, how do they give you their money? Is basically what they're asking. Um, and so, and there were also a couple other questions of where do you get the numbers? Um, some people aren't given numbers or phone lists. Cognizum is the answer. Cognizum uh, can provide you contact data for people who are actually actively looking for solutions like yours right now. So it's not just uh, a list based on demographic match. It's a list of people who are actually interested in what you sell. Um, and so I highly recommend checking out Cognizum. Also the sponsor of this webinar, Close Friends of Sales Hacker. They're great. Um, for Josh, a couple of people, um, Mark earlier pointed out that in the opening of that script, there are two asks. There's a, I was hoping I could, and then would that be okay? And there was a, a small but polite debate in the chat that those two asks um, make the caller feel, seem, seem kind of weak or ruin that, he called it uh, equal business stature. What's your take on that? Yeah, so I could, I could definitely see that. The intent behind it is to ensure that the prospect feels like they're in control and that we're not taking away their freedom to choose. So I'm giving them the ability to determine if they wanna further engage in the conversation. Um, you could certainly take away that second ask. Um, and there's lots of different ways to transition from the problem into the poke the bear. Um, but the idea here is to allow the prospect some sense of control. And again, lots of different ways to do that. Got it. Um, thanks. Uh, let's see, so here's another one um, sort of about, about scripting and the level of research you're doing. Somebody said, this was an anonymous person, that if you're prospecting into the VP level at enterprise accounts, they find it challenging to go into these cold calls without some level of personalization. Um, with these scripts, like how, how effective do you think they are in that, like do they, with that persona, do they, do they still need personalization or are these good? Yeah, so, so my take on this is people are interested in new ideas that can help them move away from something they don't want. So all VPs of sales, when I cold call and I say something like, hey, I'm calling to share a slideshow I created on small changes you can make to your email sequences that can motivate more prospects to respond. 
Um, does that sound like something you'd be open to attending or am I way off base here? Um, whether or not I say that, or, hey, I noticed that you just had this post where you liked X, Y, and Z. And have you ever heard of Josh Braun? Like to me, that doesn't add a lot. And it takes a lot of calories to personalize at that level. Um, and most of the time people aren't gonna pick up. So I'm for making it personal, meaning for all VPs of sales, what are they gonna be interested in and making it very specific. Um, you can be personal, but not have to be personalized. Um, and you save just a lot of time and you can actually talk to more people about what really matters to them, which is, can I help you move away from something you don't want or towards something you do want? The key is to make it very specific. You know, I'm talking to VPs of sales, doing an event for VPs of sales that are managing at least five reps. And we're showing a slideshow on small tweaks you can make to your cold email sequences that have the potential to motivate more people to respond. Um, does that sound like something that would be of value to you or am I like way off base here? Like that's another way to do part two. Notice it's personal around something specific, but it's not personalized. Yeah, and no, I mean, I can piggyback on that too because you know I make an incredible amount of calls. Uh, the value that you provide in the top of the funnel, the, a cold call, it doesn't matter how much research you've done. You either are gonna solve a problem that they have or you're gonna hit on a problem or a pain they have right now or not. And so um, you can research all you want about who they are and what they've done, et cetera. But if you don't actually do something that's gonna you know, solve a problem or uh, identify an opportunity they're missing or you know, get them promoted or prevent them from being fired, like you probably just shouldn't be making that call in the first place. And so um, nailing that initial value proposition that's aligned to those pain points is way more important than any personal re research. And if you want to do some research, then Steve Richard actually has a good framework. He calls it the three by three um, that you can jot in to your CRM, you know, have those quick little notes. So if they, if you get challenged, what do you know about me? What do you know about the company? You can drop those little nuggets. Um, but, uh, but honestly, uh, if, if you're not hitting on something that's going to solve a problem for that organization, then you're not going to have success anyway. It doesn't matter how much research you put into it. Yeah, I, the I last agree. thing I would just add on here is that there's a di there's a, there, like you pointed out, Josh. Maybe I'm just using different words, but there's a difference between personalization and relevance, right? Mm -hmm. And so the value of the way Joe is reaching out is that he's used Cognizant to already identify the accounts that are looking for something like Cognizant right now. Um, so so he knows that if he's calling the right contacts at those accounts, that they are interested in the problem that he's solving. Um, so the personalization becomes less important to know what college they went to or what they posted on LinkedIn is less important than, you know, the, what he, the challenge that is at hand for them. Yeah. It's like, what, what do the groups of people like this have in common that they want to move away from? Like I, I can call all triathletes that are signed up for Ironman Cozumel. And I could say something like this. Hey, hey Josh, uh, saw that you're signed up for Ironman Cozumel. I often speak to triathletes that are really struggling with the 20 plus hours of week they have to train. And I was just curious, like, how are you dealing with that? Are you like getting up early, staying up late, or are you just too tired to even answer this question? Like that's another way to go from part two to part three. And that's something that every triathlete that's signed up for Ironman Cozumel or an Ironman is going to be able to relate to. I don't need to know what they posted about or what they commented on to kind of get to the core issue there. Okay, uh, let's try one more question. We're kind of at the end here. We can squeeze in one more. Um, this is a, a quick one, an easy one. I'd say, Josh and Joe, for your experience building that script, how long do you recommend spending on a script? Joe, what's your take, Joe? Um, a script, a script's quite dangerous, I find, because it, it you can find yourself pigeonholed. Um, like what Josh and Ryan said, one of the openings there worked well for me. Like, it comes down to your tonality and how comfortable you are delivering it. So I would never script out an entire cold call just have a framework of the line and questioning you want to go down um and to be honest if you understand the product and the, the role of the prospect you're speaking to the line of question should just come with conversation um so yeah i'd probably say like 15 minutes craft a, a few variations of an opener and then that's how i would do it anyway yeah i think the advantage i think the thing the more important thing is how quickly can you test it because you don't know yeah. so what we're doing here is we're testing message product fit very quickly as Ryan said, we want to get about 10 or 15 connects and we want to make sure, hey, these are the right people, but we're not getting deep. This was to me a win. 
meaning, hey, I'd probably maybe make some tweaks to the script. And tomorrow, literally, we could have 10 more conversations. And eventually, we're going to start to know like, hey, we're getting deeper. But it does take some iterations. Like, this is why I wanted to do this cold calling. And I was hoping that it wouldn't like, everyone wouldn't just be booking meetings, because I wanted to show the process of sometimes what you have to take to kind of iterate the script. But you'll make some changes. A great way to iterate the script is to look at case studies and to see what people were struggling with, what the cost of inaction was with before and lift those words and put them in. Um, that's what I was attempting to do with this first version, but literally I had no idea what Cognizant was a week ago and we did our best shot at goal. And the idea is to just then sort of rev it up and get momentum going. Not to overthink it because most, what most people do is now they'd spend all this time writing sequences and cadences. That's a week, three weeks, four weeks. Then they got to get everyone through it. You're like at two months. What we've done here in literally 30 minutes is we've kind of said, hey, you know what? We maybe want to tweak number two before we actually start sending out 90 emails. Mm -hmm. And once they start landing and resonating, we can then start to you know pile on different channels. And that's how you know this was real. We didn't fake this. <laughs> <laughs> no safety net. Um, again, really big round of applause for, for Joe, just for being willing to step up, but also made it look easy. You did a great job. Oh. Freaking pro, man. That was amazing. Inc incredible. Some good uh, objections to our stuff, too. Right, Great guys. job. Uh, uh, we didn't get to all the questions, but if you still have questions, you want to talk about this, that's what Sales Hacker uh, is for. So you can go to the community at saleshacker.com, drop your question there. The community is great. You'll get some awesome, awesome answers. Um, and yeah, everybody should check out Cognizant. It's cognizant.com for uh, contact information. People in your account. Uh, target account list who are looking for your solution right now so you can prioritize who you're reaching out to. And thanks for coming, everybody. It was great having you. This was a lot of fun. Thanks again, Joe. Cheers, guys. Great, great job. Bye, Cheers. everybody.